This is the Chicks of Fintwit, a finance podcast by women for everyone. I am your host, Caitlin Cook. Join me as I highlight female trailblazers and their male allies across the industry as each shares their expertise on a variety of finance topics. Nothing is off limits. Thanks for joining us. Now, please enjoy this episode. All opinions expressed by Caitlin Cook and the Chicks of Fintwit podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of the host or any of their affiliates. This podcast is for informational purposes only, is not investment advice, and should not be relied upon for any investment decisions. We are not recommending any securities, nor is this an offer or sale of a security. Hello, and welcome to the Chicks of Fintwit podcast, a finance podcast by women for everyone. I am your host, Caitlin Cook otherwise known as Dead Kate Bounce on Twitter. And today we have a very special guest joining us all the way from Hong Kong, co-anchor of Bloomberg's Odd Lots podcast, as well as head of their Asian news desk, Tracy Alloway. Tracy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. I don't normally get to like talk about myself and all thoughts, I guess. So this is very exciting for me. Yeah, I love to turn the tables. You don't get to interview the interviewers very much. So I'm really excited for that. And I told you this before we started recording, but huge fan of Odd Lots, huge fan of your Twitter content for a while now. So long time listener, first time caller, but we have a ton to talk about here. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with your current role. So um, especially when it comes to Odd Lots. So I'd be a little curious at first, if you don't mind, maybe if we start from the beginning, if you could just walk us through, you know, where you started your career. Oh my gosh. Um, okay. So, uh, I started, I guess at university. So, um, I went to London for college and they had a student newspaper there and I kind of fell into it. Um, I was features editor there for a while and I did some really weird interviews for some reason. It ended up being mostly with like very right wing, like neocons from the U S and also Carlos, the Jackal, who was actually an alumni of our university um, and was in jail at the time. We did an inter- like a interview by letter, like basically pen palling <laughs> to get this interview done. And I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the people um, that I was working with at the time. A lot of that group of friends has gone on to high profile positions um, around the media space, you know, at the FT, at the BBC, places like that. Um, and then after I graduated, I knew I wanted to work in journalism. I needed an internship that actually paid was the problem. Um, I couldn't, you know, survive all my parents' money. So I found out that Bloomberg offered these summer internships. Um, They were paid quite generously at the time. Uh, And so I started working in London for Bloomberg. I was covering airlines, uh, which was quite fun. My dad was a pilot, so I felt I understood the industry a little bit. And then in late 2008, I made the switch to FT Alphaville, which was at the time a very brand new markets and finance blog from the Financial Times. And again, this was 2008. It was sort of at a time when a lot of the old school media had yet to figure out what a blog actually was. So that was really uh, enticing for me. And then I joined right at September 2008 when Lehman fell. And so I was sort of thrown in at the deep end of this financial crisis. But what was really great about it was that no one knew what was going on at the time. So you were sort of on even footing with people who'd been covering banks for like 10 years. Uh, So after that, I worked at the Financial Times for a long time covering banks, markets. And then I joined Bloomberg in 2015. Uh, And Joe and I started Odd Lots that same year. Yeah. And the rest is history. Well, I have a few questions from that. One, did you ever expect to work in finance? It sounds like you just fell into it, right? Like you just needed an internship that paid Bloomberg, really good place to have that internship. But even, I guess, first of all, how did you feel about starting working in finance? And what was your perception of that industry from the outside before you started? And then, sorry, long-winded question, but also, um, I guess... Did you foresee yourself at that point staying in that space or did you just kind of expect it to be like the internship, check it off the list and be back to somewhere else in journalism? Sure. So I think when I set out to be a journalist, I don't think I had a sort of set um, beat in mind. To be honest, like I kind of find everything interesting, which is probably why Odd Lots now is having such a great time going into like specific markets like lumber, semiconductors, things like that. 
I have to say, once I started doing financial journalism, I really enjoyed it because there are two things you learn being a financial journalist, which is one, money is so important and money sort of underpins, um, sadly, the vast majority of decisions by policymakers and pretty much everyone out there. And then secondly, you also learn that markets are made up of people. And so if the point of journalism is to tell interesting and compelling stories that also you know, have the potential to have some sort of impact or that matter for people, then telling the story through markets can be a really compelling way to do that. And again, that's one of the reasons why I find markets journalism in particular interesting because everyone's sort of talking about what could happen, right? Like, is the price going to go up? Is the price going to go down? Is this fairly valued? Is it overvalued? And so you get these big conceptual debates, but ultimately they're between people. And so understanding that tension and the stories and what's making those people think that way is really, really interesting to me. Um, and then just to answer the second part of your question, did I think I was going to do something else? I don't think so. Um, I've had some job offers over the years to go into political journalism randomly, and I've always turned it down mostly because by that point, I found financial journalism so interesting that I was sort of in it um, possibly for life. <laughs> So seeing it from the inside working in financial journalism, what do you see as, you know, the framework for within, you know, finance and market specifically in comparison to, you know, news journalism, political jour journalism and so on? When you say framework, what do you mean exactly? I is do you see a distinct difference I guess in, you know, the way you cover things, trends in the space? Uh, yeah. I know it's kind of a big question, but no, that makes sense. So that kind of gets back to what I was saying earlier. I think when you're covering something like, let's say, mainstream journalism, where you're covering local politics or even national politics, or uh, you know, some sort of disaster, this thing happened, um, it tends to be much more focused on the present. I find you may get some forward-looking analysis. You know, people might say, well the passage of this bill paves the way to an additional piece of legislation, or, you know, there's a possibility that this massive event could lead to this, but with markets, it's much, much more conceptual. And I find a lot of it has to do with ideas because everyone ultimately is trying to figure out what's going to happen in the market. So the focus is almost all always on what could happen. And so the challenge for financial journalists is to present those ideas without falling into the realm of speculation, which I find really interesting. And again, like I really enjoy it because you get to think about these issues, you get to learn about different markets, you get to kind of figure out where everyone is coming from as they, I guess, formulate their own way of thinking about this. And going back to what you said a little bit back in, you know, starting your career in 08, how did that, I, I feel like I've talked to a couple different people on the podcast about 08, but how did that shape your perspective? And I'd have to think, you know, I had a conversation with one of my friends the other day that starting out in such a turbulent time in your career, I think is pretty beneficial for you down the line because you know how to deal with chaos and you know that you know, hopefully things will normalize and the course will smooth out, but starting in such a chaotic or chaotic point in history, especially in journalism, I would assume would have had to been adv advantageous for you. Uh, I would agree with that. Um, there are some things I think people forget about some aspects of 2008 in the sense of where media actually was. And this is something I touched on earlier with Alphaville. Like, at that time, it was not normal for most traditional media to be sort of instantaneously publishing bits of insight um, in blog format. Lots of places had yet to wrap their hands around it, or sorry, had yet to wrap their heads around it. Um, at the same time, there was this independent financial blogosphere that was just exploding and was doing really, really good work on what was happening in the financial industry. Like some really, really good writers who were basically saying like, the housing market looks like it might blow up. We should probably pay attention to this. So at the time, a lot of the best insight was to be found by blogs or by independent financial commentators. And so being on a blog um, within a larger media organization was a really, really good platform to sort of gather some of those voices up 
and present them to a larger audience. And I remember, for instance, Alphaville was one of the first ones that latched on to um, Alan Stanford's Ponzi scheme after, um, I think it was Alex Dalmati, an uh, analyst, blogged about it and said, like, this looks like a massive fraud. Um, and we wrote about it very, very quickly. So being able to do that was quite novel at the time. And I think it's probably unappreciated now just because most of traditional media has really gone in that direction. Like not many journalists at traditional media organizations are now sitting there and saying, okay, I'm going to wait until, you know, 7 PM to write my front page story and then we'll get it out for tomorrow's edition. Everything is happening in real time. Uh, so there's that aspect of it. I talked a bit about how new everything was in September 2008. You know, a lot of people have been covering finance and markets for decades, but they'd never had to write a story about a money market fund breaking the buck because it had never happened before. Uh, a lot of people had covered finance without ever writing about repo markets. And then suddenly you had this massive crunch in the shadow banking system. So that was really helpful because it basically meant I could learn things at the same time that other people were learning about them. And I do think that's probably an influence that you feel in odd lots in the sense that, you know, I know nothing about the lumber market until we actually sit down with a lumber market expert and start to talk about it. So that definitely influences the podcast. And then the last thing I would say about how it influenced my perspective personally, and it took me a while to realize this, I think I was focused on financial stability issues for longer than I perhaps should have been. Um, I think because my experience was based on, you know, the worst thing that had happened in the financial system for many, many years, for like a decade after that, I was probably looking around the corner for the next big blow up, which didn't really materialize because of the shift that we'd seen in the approach from central banks and from regulators. And I think that took me a long time to actually understand and appreciate. Yeah. And to your last point, I think that that's a lot of people working in the industry at that time, or even those outside, right? Always waiting for the sky to fall again. And you can't really sure. blame them, right? Just because once you've had that negative experience and you know that that's as bad as things can get, you wonder if they can get worse. I feel like that's just human nature, but um, you kind of touched on a couple of different things that I wanted to, to ask you about. One being you talk about, you know, in a way, you know, information flow is getting much faster because there was just so much going on, honestly. Yeah. How have you seen even since then with, you know, rise of social media and news has become instantaneous and very almost informal coming from all different sources, not necessarily like formal media outlets. How has that influenced your work and what are some other I guess, what have you really noticed from that trend? And it's been something that's been just, I, it's just been going kind of crazy. You see, see something every single day of like news breaking on Twitter from like a random account that no one's ever heard of. It's not like the BBC or Bloomberg breaking all of these things anymore. Totally. Well, um, so first of all, I think if you're a journalist, you need to be on social media and you need to have a presence there um, if you don't. And, you know, I understand why some people don't because it can be an extremely hellish place <laughs> at times. But if you don't, you really are losing out on discourse. You're losing out on the ability to build relationships with potential guests or sources, um, the ability to get your name out there, and the ability to spot things as they are happening. Because the chances of you spotting, you know, like some interesting but very esoteric move in a market, an obscure market that you don't follow on a daily basis versus a professional, and this is all they're doing every day, like, those are very, very small. And the reality is there are a lot of professionals on social media now who are going to share those insights on social media before they, you know, send you an email and say like, hey, have you seen this? Check this out. Um, so that's part one. And then where was I going? Sorry, one sec. I was going to say something else. Oh, yeah. And then the other way that social media, I think, has changed journalism is there's a lot more focus on short and sweet and in-depth, incredibly deep intelligent analysis. And the thing that's dropped out of favor is the sort of in the middle, like 500 word, 600 word, um, like front page news story analysis that used to be the bread and butter of what traditional media did. So nowadays, if you spot something interesting, 
the best way to cover it is to probably write about it very quickly, you know, use the primary source wherever you got it from. If it was an analyst note, someone on Twitter making an interesting point, someone you interviewed making an interesting point, put that up, get it out there. You don't have to have all the answers about why it's happening or, you know, that sort of thing. Like just get it out. And then what you probably want to do at a later date is look into it, talk to lots of different people and try to develop the sort of definitive piece. What you don't want to do is hold it back for a day while you work on a 600 word piece that's like too short to say anything interesting and much too long um, for people to actually read. So I think that's the big impact that I've seen, like lots of focus on the shorter stories, getting those out quickly. Um, while still reserving space for like really in-depth features. And we tend to see that reflected in readership. So readership for short stories is generally pretty good. Readership for big features, people will devote the time to those. If you're saying something interesting and it's worthwhile, they won't devote time to the things in the middle. So I, I think that's a big impact from uh, social media. So focusing on the short side of that, do you think that it's been a net negative for the way that people are absorbing information? I think that things can be so easily misinterpreted when you're trying to be short and punchy. Um, I don't know if you've noticed a significant difference in that, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts if so. Oh, totally. Um, so I, I see this the most on Twitter where <laughs> the character limit means like you just can't have a nuanced discussion unless you start uh, you know, crafting like a thread that consists of 50 different tweets, in which case, like, you know, why are you tweeting it um, versus just writing something and then like tweeting a link to it. Um, there is the chance that people misinterpret things that a lot of the nuance is lost. The big problem that I see with social media and with very, very short items in particular is that people tend to read them in isolation. And that can be really difficult for journalists because when I tweet something, I'm sort of tweeting it in the context of my entire body of work, like everything I've ever written on this topic. And now I'm just going to tweet something short about it. And I'm not going to regurgitate everything that I know about it. But if that tweet, you know, gains some traction, it gets retweeted, it's going to reach a bunch of people who don't follow me. And they don't know about my body of work. They don't know how I've said that I'm thinking about something previously they're only looking at that one tweet in isolation. And so I think that's where you tend to get a lot of confusion um, and often a lot of criticism and pushback. Yeah, and or social media, it's sort of a great equalizer for better or for worse and where information is yeah. coming from, which I think that's where a lot of the danger comes from, right? You might be an incredibly credible source for all of this information and have the expertise, but someone with a large platform who has a me giant megaphone could be putting out something completely contrary to that and get more views, more shares. So I, I do think it's a double-edged sword. It's nice to have that information flow so quickly, but it's, it can go wrong very, very fast, which I think a lot of people don't stop to consider until after, after the fact. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. So I guess shifting, shifting gears onto odd lots, because I did I was very excited about this episode. So I tweeted about it and wanted to see what other people thought. A lot of people on Twitter, um, which I spend way too much time on, are huge fans of Odd Lots and of yours and of Joe's. So people really want to know how the sausage is made. So I'm glad that we are sort of on the same lines. I was going to ask you about this anyway. So glad to know there's interest there other than myself. But the part that fascinates me the most, and I always enjoy listening regardless of what the topic is, because like you said, you really talk about anything. You had Neil Kashkari on recently. You were talking about avocado markets at some point. You were talking about lumber. You really go all over the place. And I have a lot of questions tied to that. But first of all, is how? Because most people cannot go 100 feet wide and 100 feet deep, which I feel like you do in every episode. And it's I, I already know that you and Joe are super bright, but I just really need to know how you make that happen and what the prep is like for that. Cause I'm always so blown away. I'm like, she really knows her avocados. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you. That's very flattering. And then second of all, I think I'm going to disappoint everyone out there by saying that the, like the creative process for all thoughts is extremely minimal. <laughs> um, I mean, I think Joe and I both benefit from our position in the newsroom and from the way we sort of exist um, very much online and in social media. 
And I think what tends to happen is that we see early inklings of something interesting developing. So for instance, last year, um, this would have been late last year, like in the fall, we started taking an interest in semiconductors because we knew um, Dan Wong from um, Gavacol Dragonomics. We'd had him on the podcast a, a couple of times before. We knew he was big on semiconductors. We were sort of watching what he was saying on Twitter and thinking, this sounds like an issue. If we get a shortage of semiconductors, this is going to blow up supply chains around the world. Um, and at the same time, we also had Bloomberg journalists who were talking about it. You had Bloomberg analysts who were starting to look into the issue. And so we can sort of spot the early trend before it actually blows up into a traditional front page story. And so if we spot something that we find interesting, what we will try to do is to find the best person to talk about it. And that's, I would say that's the trickiest part of the whole podcast, um, because again, you're not an expert, so you don't necessarily know the best voices in the space. But again, we try to draw on um, people we know in various industries across finance. Like it might be that we're friendly with someone that works like at a manufacturing company and you say, well, we want to talk about pallets. Can you put us in touch with your pallet supplier? Um, and we're going to have a wooden pallet episode. Stuff like that. Like we reach out to pretty much anyone to try to figure out who the best person is to talk about it. It might be through contact. It might be someone we've been following on social media, um, that sort of thing. And then in terms of prep, so Joe and I do independently prep for each episode. Like we usually shoot each other over an email and say like, let's focus on this for the podcast. Um, and then we go off and kind of do our own research. It's not extensive research, which I'm sure a lot of listeners have noticed on occasion. Um, but the reason we don't try, you know, the reason we're not researching and prepping for like three days ahead of an episode is because we want to keep it at a level where we're learning alongside the listener. And I think one of the drawbacks of a lot of podcasts, especially when they're highly specialized, is they start from like, up here where most listeners are sort of starting from down here. And so the thing I really like about Odd Lots, again, is when we start an episode on a new topic, um, I keep coming back to lumber or semiconductors, like we are starting it from the same place that most of our listeners are starting it from. And so we're gonna be asking the questions that they would ask. We're gonna be trying to explain the concepts that they wanna hear explained. And hopefully by the end of it, we all come out on the other side with better knowledge of the industry. And then that kind of sets the groundwork for further topics um, and further episodes on the same topic. So it's, min it's minimal prep, um, just in terms of the research that goes into it. But I would argue that kind of helps a lot. Yeah. And they're all very easily absorbable too, right? Which is what, you know, that's ideal. So what would your favorite I, this might be impossible too. It's like asking your favorite kid, but what is your favorite episode that you've done? And separately, who has been your favorite guest? It doesn't even necessarily have to be the most like in-depth episode or, you know, specific topics, but I'm sure you is, have a few. This is like choosing amongst your children. Um, okay. <laughs> Let me try to think. Um, so, so, I mean, first of all, this is sort of a cop out answer, but I will say over the past year when we've been doing all the individual industry episodes and supply chain shortage episodes, I have found massively enjoyable, partly because I think I mentioned this earlier, but I started out in financial journalism as an airline reporter. I was also covering cars, which was weird because I can't drive and I couldn't drive at the time. Um, and just transport in general, like railways. So I've always found transport and logistics weirdly interesting. So this year has been great um, from that perspective. In terms of one episode, uh, there is one that we've done, I think we actually did two episodes with a very famous archaeologist who is sometimes described as, um, you know, a real life modern Indiana Jones. And he does research into the collapse of civilizations, specializing in the Mayan uh, civilization and what went wrong there. And so it's basically like an end of the world episode. Mm -hmm. And I think about it, first of all, we don't get to talk to archaeologists that much, which is a shame. Um, and maybe we should do more of it. I, I really like archaeology and anthropology. I, I read a lot of books in that space. So I love that episode. 
But then second of all, he has made the point that societies tend to collapse like at a point of extreme complexity. And I think about that a lot, like especially <laughs> too much. <laughs> yes, and especially in the context of social media where, you know, you were making this point earlier, like there's just this deluge of information. No one can really figure out like what's going on. Everyone has strong opinions, sometimes pulling in completely opposite directions and, you know, sometimes ignoring basic Facts. And I think about that almost on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah, that would be it. Well, I'm going to be thinking about that tonight when I can't sleep. Um, <laughs> when when are we going to see another collapse of civilization? Because it seems like the time. There's way too much going on right now. <laughs> um, I Well, that's great on the odd lots. I Another thing that I did want to add, you know, I'm talking to you from Hong Kong. Well, you're in Hong <laughs> Kong, not me, unfortunately. Never been. Heard good things. But one <laughs> thing I... I um, I have noticed quite a bit is that you've traveled a lot. Um, and I selfishly, I also enjoy traveling and I'm very curious to see one, I mean, from a work perspective and like how you view the global economy, I feel like a lot of people are, well, especially in the U S obviously are very U S centric and, you know, mm-hmm. the U S is the center of everything. And I think obviously very, you know, home bias there. So how is all of your travel shaped the way that you view the economy? Sure. Um, it's kind of a tough question. Um, so I don't think a lot of people know this, but I grew up in Tokyo, um, like on and off or from the age of like three to 18. And then I went to university in London and I was there for 10 years. And then let's see, I was in Vienna when I was little as well. And then I moved to New York I think in 2011, I want to say, stayed in New York for a while. And then I was in Abu Dhabi for a few years in the United Arab Emirates. And now I'm in Hong Kong. Um, And like, I've traveled and worked in various places um, along the way. Like I was in Beijing for a few months and things like that. Um, It gives you, this is going to be unsurprising to pretty much everyone, but like it gives you a different perspective on the way the world works. It definitely gives you appreciation that not everyone is seeing things the way you assume they're seeing them. Basically it breaks you out of the bubble that you may or may not exist in. And what I mean by that is, you know, for instance, I remember going um, from New York to Abu Dhabi in, this would have been in 2016, shortly after Trump won the election. And, you know, most people in New York are going, oh my God, this is absolutely insane. What has happened? I can't believe Donald Trump is our president. The world is going to end. Civilization is going to collapse, that sort of thing. And then you go to Abu Dhabi and everyone there is very, very excited about it and see it as a massive opportunity. Now we found out later that maybe they saw it as too much of an opportunity, but like it does, it does offer you a different perspective. Um, And that's something that I've appreciated. And then in terms of the economy specifically, I do think it helps, helps you to sort of connect some of the global flows that are happening and that can sometimes be underappreciated. So for instance, if you cover US bonds, like US corporate debt, um, you're probably not, if, if you've been doing that from New York for your entire life, you're probably not necessarily thinking about what's going on in Asia all the time. But of course, some of the world's biggest corporate bond buyers are either in Taiwan or in Japan. And so being able to appreciate where those pools of capital actually are, that are driving price action in a large market like the US, that's really helpful. Same thing, of course, for the Middle East, for petrodollars. Um, Again, like I think the movement of that kind of flow tends to be an underappreciated one when it comes to markets. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'd have to ask specific to Hong Kong now, how has it been more recently? I feel like you see a lot in the news, but boots on the ground. What have you noticed being different environment wise there? Yeah, so I arrived in Hong Kong in late 2018, which was basically before the start of the protests um, and also before the start of the global pandemic. And in that short amount of time, 
Hong Kong has changed um, quite dramatically. There's obviously the new national security law, which I think is concerning for a lot of business people and expats who are based here. Everyone's trying to wrap their heads around what exactly could constitute um, going against the law. And unfortunately, it's not entirely clear. So what you end up with is a situation where you just have to be very, very careful because you don't necessarily know what might be um, troublesome from a national security law NSL perspective. Uh, so that's changed a lot and you can definitely feel it. Um, we did a story, I think it was last year, that was inspired by um, where I live in Hong Kong, which is in Soho. There's a street called Hollywood Road. When I first got here, Hollywood Road was this like booming place, lots of restaurants, lots of bars, lots of little antique shops um, and things like that. Great place to wander around. And in like mid 2020, it was just dead and storefront after storefront um, was shuttered. Lots of restaurants and bars had closed for obvious reasons. So you can see it like it feels very different. Now, the question is, if COVID finally at some point is behind us and maybe the border opens up with mainland China, do things start to go back to normal? Is that going to be enough? Are you still going to see expats um, or white collar immigrants, whatever you want to call them, committed to the city? Is it still going to be an international financial center? And I think, again, that's sort of unappreciated. There's lots of evidence that Hong Kong is going to remain a financial center. And what you've seen over the past year and a half or so is that flows from mainland China have been absolutely booming. Like it's been a bonkers year for uh, Hong Kong IPOs, but they've all been Chinese companies who are moving from the US over to the Hong Kong exchange. I'm not sure that necessarily qualifies Hong Kong as a sort of international financial market, but let's see, that might be enough. Like being being the, the entry point for wider China, like maybe that's enough. Well, TBD on that, so keep an eye out. Hopefully we see things subsiding with COVID here, but fingers crossed. Um, on that on the expat part, has there been a substantial outflow of expats in, in recent months, year? Sure. So I don't think we have a breakdown by um, like citizenship necessarily, but I can tell you because I tweeted this yesterday. So let me just make sure I have the numbers right. I think Hong Kong's population has shrunk by, I want to say 89,000 over the past 12 months. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So Hong Kong's population falling by 89,000 just in a year. And that's not really the kind of demographic trend that you would necessarily want to see. Now, some of those will be um, longtime residents who are moving to the UK, which is offered a sort of asylums um, for people leaving Hong Kong. Some of that will definitely be financial workers, people who are either uncomfortable um, because of the, the new environment um, for working here or are frustrated with not being able to travel for, I mean, it's coming up to almost two years now that people in Hong Kong haven't been able to travel without going into a very, very onerous quarantine. So yeah, for sure it's happening. Um, I don't have the exact breakdown of expat versus residents. Right. Okay. Um, and I guess I'm, I, I do want to change topics almost entirely, but first, where is your favorite place you've ever traveled? I feel like you've been, been a lot of places, but I feel like it could also be, you know, favorites culturally, architecturally, sure, yeah. you know, nature. So, uh, um, Tokyo is probably my all time favorite city. I had so much fun there growing up, like really surreal moments where like, you'd be in a club and suddenly like an hour. I remember at our after prom, Jay Z pulled up in like a big like, white um, van car thing and got out and was like, come with us, we're gonna go do a concert at like this other club around the corner. And I was like, okay. <laughs> like stuff like that doesn't really happen elsewhere. Um, I did karaoke with like Ian McKellen when he was there on the Lord of the Rings tour, like just a very surreal Tokyo experience. Um, and I've always appreciated like the culture there as well. The fact that the rhythm of life tends to be quite tied to the seasons and nature. Um, 
And Japan does get these extreme seasons where like fall is beautiful and you have, you know, the changing of the colors, winter is cold, but not like absolutely freezing, like in New York, beautiful spring with cherry blossoms and then a hot summer. So you have these really defined seasonal characteristics, which I always enjoyed. Um, one place I've been thinking a lot about recently is Pakistan. Um, so my mother worked there for, uh, I can't remember how long it was exactly, maybe four years. And I visited her and, um, I mean, I really enjoyed it. Not many people get to visit Pakistan. Uh, <laughs> we had some amazing food, like this really good lamb barbecue. Ooh. One thing that people don't know about Pakistan is there's weed growing everywhere. <laughs> like You'll be walking down the street and like just on the side of the road, there's like actual marijuana plants that are as high as your head. Um, they're not, not that I tried this, but apparently they're not very good to smoke um, because of something I can't remember exactly why, but like it is kind of surreal to be walking through feeds fields of of actual weed, um, and then I just found like the people very welcoming. Um, there's like wherever you well, I was there with my husband, and there are lots and lots of Pakistani men who wanted to meet him and say hi to him. Um, it's different for women, obviously, but everyone was very welcoming and friendly. I told people I was American, um, you know, it wasn't really a problem. Uh, so I've been thinking a lot about that in the context of Afghanistan recently, especially since we're expecting a big influx of Afghani refugees into Pakistan, which has always been a point of contention among local Pakistan politicians and people as well. Yeah. Wow. I actually don't know if I've ever talked to someone who's traveled there. So that's really interesting. Um, always interesting to hear like someone who's actually been there because we all like to make our judgments without factual basis. But um, I I guess the last thing I do want to talk about, um, because I know we want to be cognizant of your time, but for, you know, this is called the Chicks of Fintwit podcast. So I'd be remiss if I did not mention, you know, being a chick on Fintwit on this podcast. And I did share this beforehand. There, you, there was a tweet thread that you put out quite a while ago. And I probably would have asked you about this without seeing that, um, to be honest with you, just because you are you do have quite a large audience, you know, your public figure, you're on TV, you're in the media. And, you know, you did put out a thread kind of talking about the attention and the different experiences that women on, on FinTwit, but just generally I, um, you know, in social media and in the public really have versus men. And Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't even know where to start with that really, but I'm sure that your experience has been quite interesting if I had to guess. Um, So I guess maybe we'll just start there. It's definitely a big topic. I feel like things have changed a lot since I started out in finance uh, or in financial journalism. Like there were things that I experienced in the early days of financial journalism that I don't think would happen as regularly now. There might be isolated incidents, but um, you know, just cases of like blatant sexism, um, sources who would try to come on to you, that sort of thing. I'm sure some of that does still happen, but now it's much more acceptable to actually talk about it um, Mm -hmm. and to sort of um, brainstorm different ways of dealing with it. Uh, And I know certainly at Bloomberg, we've done a lot of work creating sort of informal networks for female journalists where they can talk about this issue and also talk to more senior journalists about how to deal with it, what the appropriate response is, and also what support Bloomberg can actually offer them. So just stuff like that has been massively, massively helpful and has changed quite a lot. Now, the bad part of all this and where I would say things have gotten worse is probably on the social media side. And I've certainly noticed this over the past year or so. I think when people are in trouble, and obviously the past year with the COVID pandemic, everyone's been having a very miserable experience. Social media can become a very dark place. And I feel like the other thing that's happened at the same time is you've had um, Bitcoin and crypto go absolutely mainstream, lots of interest there. You've also had the meme investing phenomenon, which, you know, is almost exclusively a sort of Wall Street bets, Reddit phenomenon with lots and lots of guys involved. And so I think for a lot of women in FinTwit, it feels like it's a very masculine space at the moment. And sometimes that energy can be quite, um, what's the right word? Maybe exhausting. I don't know. Like I I do feel like 
it presents both opportunities and challenges. Like you can be embraced by the crypto bros, by the GameStop bros. Um, you can produce great content, you know, meme content that's funny that they really appreciate. And that's lovely. But I also feel like if you make an argument that doesn't sit well with their way of thinking, the pile on for a woman on social media is much, much more extreme than it is for a guy. And again, like part of that might just be because men tend to dominate on platforms like Twitter. So if you're a woman, you say something, you get 5,000 replies to you. Like I guarantee you 98% of those are probably coming from men or anonymous accounts that certainly look like men. And so that alone can make it feel much, much more intense, I think, than if you're a guy. And before people start, you know, like picking this this apart. I have actually done, I did an experiment on this just because I wanted to make sure I wasn't going crazy. Um, so I tweeted something about Bitcoin and inflation, basically just saying like, I don't think that coin is an inflation hedge. Mm -hmm. um, and I got like a massive pylon from the Bitcoin maxis, as you would expect. And then Joe, my co-host tweeted something very similar two days later. And so I took all the responses to both and I broke them down by category of insult. And like, as you might expect, like the, the insults that were hurled at me were very much about like my profession and my looks like, oh, you call yourself a financial journalist, you're bad at your job um, and terrible things about the way I look, stuff like that. The insults for Joe were, first of all, a different magnitude of insult. Like they were, they were much more polite, even though they were insulting but it was stuff like that's dumb bro versus like mm -hmm. you need to go back to being a waitress kind of thing so i i do think women have a different experience it's hard to get perfect one for one examples although you know it'd be great if someone actually did some research on this topic and so i just think it's something that we need to be cognizant about and we need to be having the discussions um and i do think it can be an emotional drag on people in their careers like i know on days where i've had five thousand people shouting at me that you're terrible at your job like that does impact my work performance so i think yeah it's just something to be aware of something to discuss and hopefully we can provide support to people who are experiencing it well I'm glad that this is exactly why we have these conversations though, right? Because any chance there is to sort of highlight this, we need to, because if we don't, nothing will change. And the, the problem with social media, obviously being that anyone can hide behind a screen. I literally remember that someone told you once if you, well, this is kind of your fault for not being an anonymous account or masquerading as a man, which is unbelievable. You'd never say that to a man and switch that up. Like it oh. blows my mind, the comments that you get and you actually took something that I was going to say to you. So you're, you were ahead of me. I was going to say that I'd be curious to see an experiment where you and Joe tweet the same thing and get a response back because my friends and I almost did the exact same thing. You're people are so at the ready to jump down your throat for whatever reason. And I feel like, and I've even noticed my platform is far, far smaller that if you put anything out, that's more like, educational, cerebral, like you've really put your thought and your research into it. People are just very much at the ready with their pitchforks. Whereas a lot of, a lot of men, I don't think there's quite as much nitpickiness and it's pretty, totally. it's pretty patent too. So, um, I mean, I did want to mention that just because I've, I've noticed that and it's, it's really crazy to see. I mean, it's definitely gotten better, but social media just even in the last year, I don't know if it's just everyone bored at home or, especially on the investing side and finance is already male dominated, like you said, but just the socialization of it all um, has gotten people a lot more aggressive, or at least in, in my eyes, it has. Totally. I do feel like it's more intense over the past year. And I do agree with you about the points of like research coming from women versus research coming from a men, from men. Um, and then again, like the difficulty, even for us talking about it, like, I don't want to see like I'm complaining because on the one hand, I'm sure being a woman has been beneficial um, at certain points in my career. Um, but on the other hand, like, I do think we have to talk about it. Otherwise, it just gets worse and people feel like they're dealing with it alone. So it, it, it's, it's a challenging problem. It is. And you navigate it very well. And it obviously has not 
hindered you from doing what you do, um, which you do very well, but I know we're coming up on, you know, time here. So I do, I do usually ask some fun questions at the end. One okay. being, um, I, I really want to ask you about your dog. People on Twitter always mention him It's Pablo, right? So yeah. a corgi. Um, I do want to ask about him. I know I'm a huge dog fan. So people specifically from Twitter, that was probably if I had to try to remember what the count was on different topics for discussion with you, um, I think Pablo was in the top three. Should I be worried that like the dog is, is more like interesting people, to people? People love a dog. People love a yeah. dog. <laughs> yeah. Um, Pablo's great. Uh, he's on a walk right now. Um, he is a tricolor corgi. He's a pandemic pup that we got in March of 2020. Um, my husband and I have been talking about getting a dog for a long time and then we were all stuck at home. So I think we did what a lot of people did and said like, you know what, we're just going to go for it. He's been absolutely wonderful. Um, the thing I really like about Pablo is he basically has become a sort of avatar for me to sometimes say stuff about <laughs> more sensitive topics. So I feel like if I can't criticize Bitcoin without having a pile on from the maxis, Pablo can. Pablo can say something about crypto. And if they start arguing with him, well, they're arguing with the dog and that's kind of crazy, right? But um, no, it's fun. It's fun to sort of see the world through um, a puppy's eyes. And he's just brought a lot of joy into my life. And um, he's actually inspired a few articles. So I did a story about uh, dog Instagram last year, which was like one of the few bright spots on social media, like this pure area of the internet where people just look at pictures of dogs and talk about their pets. Um, so that was a nice offset to the rest of the year. And then I also did a piece this year about puppy inflation and how basically demand for pandemic pets in 2020 had led to um, a sort of bullwhip effect in the market where you were now seeing extreme shortages and extreme oversupplies and sort of um, very volatile price movements. So that's been interesting. The puppy bubble thing actually makes me laugh a bit because for the longest time, one, I mean, I think the, the COVID thing, like my roommate got a golden retriever puppy. I was going to get one before I changed jobs as well. I don't regret it. Love my job, but you I, recommend it if, you, if you're if you able to at some point, it is. Fun. Oh yeah. I, I love dogs. I have two goldens at home and everything. So I always grew up with them, but um, I, the longest thing I've been talking about, I'd be curious to see, I don't know how you break this down, but someday if you get bored in your research, because you're very good at what you do on the dog front, I'd be curious to see my theory is that there is a massive doodle bubble. Doodles are very expensive. Doodles yeah. and like French bulldogs and like just anything in like the sort of Frenchy esque type of dog, huge mm -hmm. bubble. It's like five grand. They're expensive. Oh, um, totally. So I actually, I have seen analyst research <laughs> where they've like broken down cockapoo prices versus like doodles and Frenchies. And you're absolutely right. It's so I think French bulldogs are now the number one um, dog breed in the States, or at least they were as of 2020 when I last looked at this. Um, and like anything doodle, but the problem with doodles is it's hard to get actual research because the AKC doesn't recognize them as a breed. So they don't keep track of the breeding numbers. So I don't know where you would get that information from, but anecdotally, I'm totally with you on the, uh, on the doodle bubble. There are so many doodles in my neighborhood. It's like everywhere you go, they're cute. I'm not mad about it. I'm, I'm a big dog fan personally, other than corgis. I actually do love corgis. So um, that is wonderful, but I guess the other question for you, and I feel like you seem like a bit of a foodie. Um, I feel like, I feel like I've seen you put posts up about that. And from all your travel, I'd imagine the food is incredible, but what else do you do in your off time to decompress? Uh, yeah, so I like love get outside person as I always <laughs> advertise on this podcast. <laughs> I, um, I love cooking. Uh, I find it really like calming and soothing and I tend to do just lately I've, I've gone into more elaborate like European dishes um that I haven't necessarily done before so last weekend I did like a burf bourguignon pie um which I hadn't done so good like a chicken pot pie but with beef and red wine sauce really good um and the thing I like to do while I cook is listen to either podcasts or audiobooks um mm -hmm. usually if I'm doing anything around the house if I'm walking the dog, if I'm going on a hike, if I'm commuting to and from work, I will almost always be listening to something in audio format. 
Um, and especially audiobooks recently have basically like doubled the amount of books I'm able to read uh, every year. So that's been really great. And I really enjoy doing that. And also if you're listening to a really compelling book while you're cooking, it doesn't really matter how long it takes you to cook something, you know, two hours is whatever, if you're listening to um, something really good. That is a good point. I always try to do that too. I, that's the one thing I miss from not commuting to the office is always listening to audiobooks. Um, last one and I'll, I'll let you go here, but what's your, what's your favorite book since you, you mentioned some on, um, like some history. Oh, man. <laughs> um, that's like, I, again, asking for, a, to pick yeah, a different style, but this is really hard. I really like Lonesome Dove by Larry McMurtry. Um, I remember Watership Down was my favorite when I was growing up. Um, I will give a shout out to a book I'm reading right now, which is the tiger by it's John Valiant. Uh, which is a really interesting um, sort of short story about a tiger hunt, but that tells you a lot about um, the Soviet Union and Russia. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And then I'm also reading very randomly a history of uh, numismatics. So the study of coins, numismatics. I don't know if I'm pronouncing, this is the, this is the downside of reading a lot is you end up not knowing how to pronounce the words that you're reading. Um, But it's basically a history of the science of studying coins does it cover and digital coins? It actually, <laughs> actually, in the beginning, it does talk a lot about crypto. And it makes the point that, you, like, even though we're moving to a cashless society, when the time came to name this new form of money, we still went with coin, which kind of suggests, like, what a hold coins actually have on our collective history. So that one's pretty good. I'll have to add that to my list. I'm curious now. I didn't expect it to actually include crypto. So that's a bonus. But um, Tracy, I want to thank you so much for being on the pod. Honestly, like I said, very openly a fangirl, meant a lot. So really appreciate the time. This was so much fun. And hopefully we'll have we'll have you and Joe back on for an odd lots chicks of thin twit collaboration here in the future. But where can for those living under a rock at the end of this conversation, where can people find you for your insights? Ah, okay. So I am on Twitter at Tracy Alloway. Um, you can do a Google search for Bloomberg <laughs> Odd Lots and you'll find the podcast and you'll also find um, a new website that Joe and I have created. Uh, please subscribe and, you know, help pay my um, birth bourguignon uh, expenses. Uh, <laughs> Joe and I have been blogging um, on that site and we're trying to do transcripts for our episodes and lots of things like that. So it's good stuff. And thank you so much, Caitlin, for inviting me. And I love that you're doing this. Um, Chicks of Fintwit is such a great idea. And it's lovely that you're elevating some of the voices in the space. So thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you. And thank you to everyone for listening. We will be back next Thursday with a new episode.